We start with our first session today, Inflammatory Markers in Today's Era, by the Doyen of Pediatric Rheumatology, Dr. Raju Khupchandani, sir. Let's, let's tap the inflammatory mark to serve. For this session, I would first like to call upon the chairpersons, Dr. Sanjay Hendre and Dr. Jayesh Panon. Dr. Sanjay Hendre, sir, is a consultant uh, pediatrician practicing in Thane and also our uh, ex-president for Thane Academy of Pediatrics. I welcome you, sir. Thank you. The co-chair is Dr. Jayesh Panod. He is an associate professor at Rajiv Gandhi Medical College at Kalawa. He is also the pediatric and deputy medical superintendent at in a 1,070-bedded dedicated COVID hospital in Thane and a member of task force for the pediatric COVID with Thane Municipal Corporation. Notably, Dr. Jayesh Panod was felicitated by the Honorable Governor of Maharashtra for his outstanding work for COVID pandemic in July 2021, apart from many other felicitations that has, have been conferred upon him by various local gover governance and uh, other social bodies. He has more than 25 publications in National and International Journal. With that, I welcome both of you, Dr. Sanjay Hendre and Dr. Jayesh Panon. May I request Dr. Sanjay Hendre, sir, to quickly introduce Dr. Raju Khup Chandani. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Amruta. Amruta, next slide. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we, uh, Thane Academy of Pediatric, welcome you all for this Tapicon 21. And uh, I request you all to keep your mobile phone on mute mode so that uh, it won't disturb anybody. Uh, we are starting first session, Dr. Uh, inflammatory markers in today's era by none other than Dr. Raju Khupchandani, sir. He is uh, uh, very well known to everyone of us here and he is pediatric rheumatologist with 25 years of experience, founder, convener of uh, Pediatric Rheumatology Society of IAP. He is Asia's sole representative of five international consensus group meetings and uh, we welcome you, sir, uh, for this TAPICON 21 and uh, we will start the session. Thank you. Of very, very superb organizational skills and a very, very well-crafted scientific program. Uh, I think one of the important things I would like to state is, you know, the Master of Ceremony very beautifully stated the difficult times we have been going through, but I think it should be summarized very well in Amitabh Bachchan's word, Ye bhi gudar jayega. And uh, in lighter vein, I think one of the best acute phase reactants you could have seen right now is Dr. Sanjay Hindre's pulse rate as he called me in the last 10 minutes at least twice to check whether I was alive or I needed oxygen or anything at all. I think we were all very tense that this part will start well or not. But I think we are on our way now. So let me start sharing my slides. Give me just five seconds. And while I do that, I just request somebody to give me a signal to say that my voice is coming through well. Sanjay, if you could just raise your thumb to say Sir, that yes, my voice. voice is coming very well. Lovely. So, in the next 20 odd minutes, I would take you to some of the current knowledge on acute phase reactants and how I use them in specifically in rheumatology. So let's go back in the day, just a moment for everybody to know 
that ESR was something that was discovered in the 1920s and CRP came in the 30s and while I started presenting, preparing for this lecture, I realized how little I knew about it because I didn't even know how CRP had got its name. What happened was that in the 1930s, they found in the blood a protein that reacted with the pneumococcal C polysaccharide. And this was what was found in the acute infectious stage. And that's how it got the name C reactive protein. Now, you could have inflammation due to any cause. This inflammation gives rise to several things that happen in the body. One is the acute phase proteins, which is what we are going to be talking about in the rest of the talk. But then there are other features also, neuroendocrine features such as fever, metabolic changes such as lipolysis, osteoporosis and several other features. Then you have hematologic changes like anemia, thrombocytosis, hepatic metabolism changes and new protein constituents. Your zinc may fall, your copper may go up, etc. But these are all the changes and the reason for all these changes coming is basically a defense mechanism. So for example, your uh, fight or flight uh, hormones, catecholamines, your metabolic because all your fat is going to be melted and moved towards everything that is required to combat the foreign pathogen. So, however, the subject of our talk today is acute phase proteins. Now, what should be the ideal uh, sort of attribute of an acute phase protein, it should be specific ideally. So for example, procancitonin for bacterial infections or pro-BNP as a cardiac stress marker, measurable easily, fever for, for that matter, CRP, ESR, growth parameters. Now that doesn't really come under acute phase proteins. But I've put it down there as an example to show measurable easily. Rapidly responsive. So ESR we know takes longer to rise and longer to fall. And clinically relevant. For example, ferritin in macrophage activation syndrome. Now, for those of us who get initiated into knowing more about inflammation, as you read the first few pages, you think that this is just a tangled web of MTNL wires which are really difficult to comprehend. But when you go deeper into the story, you realize that no, nature doesn't do this. Nature does things in a much more orderly manner. There are positive loops, there are negative loops, there are various feedback mechanisms and nature is a very organized, disciplined person. So, what are acute phase proteins? These are proteins whose values change by more than 25% of normal during the inflammatory state. So, this is not specific for rheumatologic illness. They are also produced due to various other situations. Infections, infiltrative disorders, malignancies, etc. Now, acute phase proteins are divided into two groups, the positive acute phase proteins and the negative ones, which means those which show a rise in level and those which show a drop in level. Please note here CRP, fibrinogen, ferritin, procalcitonin and N-terminal pro BNP are the ones I'll be talking a little more about in the next few slides. The negative APRs, a drop in albumin, drop in RBP, drop in transferrin. These are the negative acute phase reactants. And basically the postulate is that these drop 
only because this material is being transferred towards some of these processes which you see on the left of the slide to help the process. So this is the funda behind negative acute phase reactants. So just to show you that if you see what this graph talks about is the duration from the inflammatory stimulus and here you see the change in concentration and this is what tells you about the responsiveness of an acute phase reactant. So if you see CRP, within hours it has gone up, similar to serum amyloid A. On the other hand, look at fibrinogen and why this is relevant is that fibrinogen is what you measure when you measure ESR. So this is taking longer to come and this explains why ESR takes longer to rise and longer to fall. And here you see the negative acute phase reactants transfer in albumin. They have started dropping as the inflammatory stimulus has come a few days later. So this basically was to just illustrate this concept. Now, as I mentioned to you, what the ESR does, we know that you take a tube and you see what's the distance that the RBCs fall. Basically, it is an indirect measure, as I mentioned a minute ago, of fibrinogen. Basically, it rises, as I again showed you in the earlier slide, a couple days after the inflammatory stimulus. The CRP, on the other hand, rises faster and the CR protein, as I mentioned to you when they discovered it in pneumococcal infection, it has a role to play. These acute phase proteins don't just come like that as I showed in that tangled mass of wires. All of them have a role to play in the inflammatory process. Now, if you try to measure, compare ESR with CRP, ESR is obviously cheap. It gives a more long-term trend. It's much easier to perform. But ESR is influenced by variable factors, age, sex, pregnancy, lipid levels, and above all, hemoglobin level. It is uh, been approximately calculated that for every one gram drop in hemoglobin, the ESR can go up by 10 millimeters per hour. So these are factors that you need to consider when you uh, interpret the ESR levels. Now, ESR and CRP are the ones that we use most commonly and I'll be keeping that part of the talk towards the end of my talk where I will show you five or six illustrative cases and how we use the ESR and CRP. But let's go to these little more fashionable ones which have become more relevant in the COVID days. So the first is pro-BNP. What happens is there is a precursor. Let's understand. BNP stands for brain natriuretic peptide. Now this precursor breaks into two parts. The bioactive part and the N-terminal pro-BNP which is biologically inactive. This is what we measure. What does the bioactive part do? Exactly the opposite of renin-angiotensin mechanism. So it influences natriuresis, it influences diuresis. And it is secreted by the ventricles in response to any systolic or diastolic overload. So the moment there is a myocardial stretch, out comes this particular item. Now, it's therefore very logical to understand why it has been used as a marker for KD. We all know that KD is a clinical diagnosis. So there's always been a persistent search to try and use markers which would differentiate that incomplete KD from a non-KD condition. Any other cardiac disease, cardiac surgeons use it quite often post-operatively. Then it's been used 
recently in trying to differentiate Kawasaki from Miss C. Mixed results. And lastly, there are small elevations seen in infections. So this is the study which was done in West Bengal by Dr. Priyankar Pal, where he talked about uh, using anti-pro BNP levels in Kawasaki and Missy. But he says if you use both with CRP and anti-pro BNP, you are in a better position. But differentiation between KD and uh, MIS-C is a bit tricky. Let's move to procalcitonin. Procalcitonin is nothing but a precursor of calcitonin. Now, calcitonin we know is secreted by the C cells of the thyroid and some neuroendocrine lung cells. It's encoded by this gene on chromosome 11. Now, what happens is procalcitonin converts to calcitonin within the thyroid gland itself. So therefore, in circulation, there is no procalcitonin. My uh, spelling an error here, not no calcitonin, but no procalcitonin in the circulation. In bacterial infections, peculiarly, what happens is this gene starts telling even other tissues to start creating procalcitonin. And in those other tissues, Procalcitonin to calcitonin conversion is not possible. Therefore, basically, procalcitonin rises in infectious illness. However, IFN gamma, which is what is secreted in response to viral infections, inhibits procalcitonin. Therefore, you do not see it raised in viral infections. It has a very short half-life. It's completely absent in health. It's rapidly responsive both ways, meaning early to rise, early to fall. And it can very well help differentiate viral from bacterial infections. However, surgery, trauma, shock, pancreatitis, carcinoma of the thyroid, medullary carcinoma of the thyroid. In fact, it is used as a marker to diagnose the condition and small cell carcinoma of the lung, again because these have neuroendocrine cells, these are the ones in which you may have false positive states. How do we use them? For a rheumatologist, a single hot joint of two days duration is a big issue. Is this septic arthritis? Is it reactive arthritis? Not infective. So, basically look if there is a focus of infection elsewhere. Suppose this child also has a pyoderma or a pneumonia somewhere. Then your procalcitonin is going to be elevated anyways. You can't use it then. On the other hand, there is no other focus of infection. Measure procalcitonin and tap the joint. Now, if you have gram-positive staining or procalcitonin higher than 0.25, Start antibiotics while you wait for culture reports. On the other hand, your gram stain is negative, your procalcitonin is low. Then look at your clinical suspicion is also low. Start looking at alternative diagnosis. On the other hand, clinical suspicion remains still very high. You may start antibiotics while awaiting culture and withdraw them as soon as you have more information. The other place where we use is in diseases where you have a known rheumatic disease. Say for example, either lupus or either anchor associated vasculitis or is a Stills disease. Then there are some diseases which are known to have slightly elevated levels. In them, you have to use different cutoffs and interpret it. But on the other hand, see what happens in lupus. In lupus, this is never known to be elevated at all. So the moment you see an elevated procal, you can be very confident that you are likely to be dealing with an infection. And I'll come to this point in the next minute or two. And the fundas of ferritin. 
Fun ferritin is not only an acute phase protein, but people are increasingly convinced that it plays additional roles in the pathogenesis of certain inflammatory pathways. Now, the basic issue is that you want to minimize free iron available to pathogens. And there are four hyperferritinemic states, macrophage activation syndrome, septic shock, catastrophic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, and adult onset Stills disease. These four are collectively called the hyperferritinemic syndromes. And that's why if you recall one of the earliest slides, I said, you know, specific to certain conditions, and I gave example of these four disorders. Now, let's just look at five cases where we are going to show you how I use the ESR and CRP. This is a nine-year-old boy with a two-month history of high-grade TDN fever associated with rash and arthritis of small and large joints. And his laboratories are as follows. I'm going to play a small quiz, but I'm sure everybody has guessed. I need just three minutes more. Chairpersons, I need only three minutes more. The clinical impression would be systemic JIA, and we start the child on methotrexate and steroids. When he comes back a few weeks later, his hemoglobin has gone up, his ESR has come down, his counts are down, his platelets are better. So we know we've used these to monitor response in short. Now you have this same child with systemic GI who now comes with high grade continuous fever. His ESR has arguably come down from 65 to 17. His platelets have rapidly come down. His hemoglobin has dropped, mind you, the other direction. White cell counts have come down. Now, if you saw this second line by itself, you may say, okay, this child is not too bad. His ESR is down, but he has now a continuous high grade fever. Watch the trend more than the absolute values. It's easy to know that this child is macrophage activation syndrome. You are additionally going to ask for a ferritin and a lipid profile and an SGPT to look for hypertriglyceridemia and raised liver enzymes. We won't go into management. Now this is a six year old girl and she had multiple swollen joints and was referred as a case of refractory GI. But all through her reports looked like this. And we said, this is not an inflammatory condition. And then we were remarkably struck by the symmetry of joint involvement and remarkably struck by this short first toe and remarkably struck by the osteopenia of the bones. To cut the long story short, this child actually had a non-inflammatory disease called Mona syndrome, multicentric osteolysis nodulosis arthropathy. But the key came right from the beginning to see that despite it being long-standing, the acute phase reactants were always normal. So second message here to differentiate inflammatory from non-inflammatory disease. And here is a child with lupus. In scenario one, you find that the counts have dropped. ESR has risen, but the CRP is normal. This is a typical flare in lupus. CRP is normal. A normal CRP rules out infection. It becomes very important when a child with lupus comes with fever to know is this fever due to flare or due to infection. This is one test. Procal is the other test I spoke about and said I will talk about later. Scenario B. The hemoglobin is this way, but your CRP has gone up. Your Procal may have gone up too and your white cell count is high. This is super added infection. 
become very vigorous because the child is already immunosuppressed. And scenario C, your hemoglobin has gone down, your counts are down, platelets are down, but ESR has also dropped. Remember that even patients with lupus can have macrophage activation syndrome. And coming to my last slide, look at this very common scenario. You have a child with Kawasaki disease, or for that matter, even Miss C. On the left, you see his readings on the day you make your diagnosis. On the first day, have you given him IVIG, he is afebrile. And then comes day two, he runs fever. And immediately there is panic. Then, which test will you perform to know whether you are, whether he is a refractory to IVIG case or whether this is the normal febrile response you may get in response to IVIG. So here, what you will do is, you will do the CRP. And why so? Because IVIG influences the ESR. And therefore, whenever you are starting treatment in a patient with Kawasaki or MIS-C, if you have not done a CRP earlier, please make sure because this is the test that's going to help you to monitor the course of the disease. I end my talk just reminding some of you that this is some online training that I conduct and it's open to people from the age of 25 to 65, about 30% of my uh, delegates have been more than 45 or 50 years old because I too believe it's never too late to learn, never too late to, and never too young to teach. So with this, I sign off my talk and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, that was a very uh, enlightening session given by us. I think it has cleared a lot of fundas regarding the uh, use of acute phase proteins in the day-to-day -day scenarios. Uh, so there is a short of time. So we'll just no, we are not picking much of a question. Uh, just one more thing uh, we would like to you to highlight on the topic, like because many of the pediatricians are just clinicians over here. So if you can highlight that role of serial CRPs or role of serial uh, monitoring of acute phase proteins in a common day-to-day -day practice. So as I mentioned that they are of... Sir, voice is not coming. Sir, your voice is not coming. Can you hear me now? Sir, now, yes. So as I mentioned that in day-to-day -day practice, you would have either two types of illnesses. One is your patients with acute infections. And in them, you are likely to be using ProCal or CRP to monitor them forward. And on the other hand, your patients with chronic inflammatory diseases, the ones you refer to the rheumatologist, those are the ones where you will need a combination of ESR and CRP to tease out certain situations. In the odd case with lupus who comes with fever, you would need uh, the ProCal added on and off late in the Miss C Kawasaki setting, do remember ProBNP. I think that's the shortest way I can uh, summarize the usage of the common ones available and reserve ferritin for the macrophage activation syndrome. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Kupchandani, sir. What a fantastic deliberation by Dr. Kupchandani, sir, here. Thank you once again. With that, we end our first session, and I thank the chairpersons for the session, Dr. Sanjay Hendre and Dr. Jayesh Manod. Uh, from us, Tan Academy of Pediatrics, we would like to felicitate our chairpersons. Dr. Sanjay Hendre, sir. And Dr. Jayesh Panath.